My name is Jenny Caratini Wright. I'm the executive director of the Woodlands Arts Council. We're super excited to have this panel, the birds and the bees, and welcome all of you. I'd like to uh, introduce Melissa and Marissa. They are the brainchild, bra brainstormers of this wonderful program, and um, so we're very grateful to them. And I'd like to introduce our panel uh, discussion host, Darren Bobley. Um, we're super excited to in invite him and and um, have him moderate this panel. So um, sit back and enjoy and come up with your questions, dear audience. And uh, thank you to all of you for being here. Well, thank you and uh, welcome everybody. We're gonna be teaching you today about the birds and the bees um, and the art of pollination. So uh, it's very exciting and uh, I'm very pleased to have our featured award-winning artist, Christina Smith with us. Let's give her a round of applause. <laughs> Beautiful work, Christina. Thank you. He's from Fayetteville, uh, Arkansas. So uh, very nice to have you. And uh, uh, on the panel today, in the top, well, from my point of view, top right corner, uh, we have Christina McKinney. Um, Christina is uh, a volunteer and a teacher associated with the, the Cockrell Butterfly Center. Welcome, Christina. Mm. And below Jenny, we have Marianne Weber. Marianne is the Education Director at the Houston Audubon Society. Welcome, Marianne. We also right in the center, uh, Becky Martinez. And Becky is uh, con con uh, Conservation Director at the Bayou Land Conservancy. So welcome, Becky. We know Marissa <laughs> and Melissa, thank you. Christina and uh, Doug Stanley. Um, <clears throat> Doug is a uh, with the Magnolia Honey Farm. He's a master beekeeper candidate. Welcome, Doug. And uh, I think that's that's all we have. And Eric Taris, citizen, thank you. And Eleanor, thank you. Um, anyway, uh, I am a complete layperson in this realm, so I'm going to start with a very the most basic question. I've always heard the word pollination my entire life. And I sort of think I know what it means, but I'm not 100% sure. I and mean, there are probably things I don't know about it. So can we start off with, with the question, what is pollination? And I think um, if we uh, start that out with uh, Marianne, uh, again, education. Um, oh, excuse me, Becky. Becky would be most, <laughs> I think, apt for that general question, if that's okay. I apologize, Becky. Uh, can you tell us what is pollination? I sure can, and I bet Marianne knows too. <laughs> I'm sure you all know, but uh, we're start yeah. sort of you, you might have the broadest point of view. So yeah, so at its broadest, um, what pollination is is just like you know every organism, um, plants, flowers, they want to create new organisms and pollination is how they do it. So you have female and male parts on flowers. So, and what pollination is doing is just transferring pollen from the male part, the anther, to the female part, um, the stigma. And so um, it can happen a couple different ways. There can be self-pollination, but just like, um, you know, with Sorry, groups of people, it's always best to diversify. <laughs> and so that's where it's good to have cross-pollination. And that's where you have pollen from one flower going to another flower. And that can happen a couple different ways. It can happen with wind, that's pretty easy. Um, and then it can happen with water, um, the pollen can move with water, or it can happen um, with pollinating animals. And so that's kind of where we are today talking about birds and bees uh, because they're excellent pollinators. Those are just animals that help move that pollen from the male to the female. Um, and so, yeah, that's really, that's really all it is. It's just, uh, you know, trying to get that next generation going. Can, are birds and bees the only animals that pollinate? or help pollinate. Can oh, you hear me? say that again, Darren, I'm sorry. Are, are birds and bees the only animals that help pollinate? I can answer this question, but would somebody else like to? Well, no, I, I, can, add, I can add to that. So yeah. 
you got birds and bees, but you have all a mirage of, of insects from moths and butterflies and crawling insects to bats. Bats are good, um, also pollinators. So there's, there's a bunch of different animals that can help. Do okay. the well, Doug, since you're the bee man, uh, would you kindly tell us how do bees actually pollinate? Okay, so statistically, um, if, you, if you look at it, up to 80% of the world's plants, uh, including 90 different food crops, are pollinated by bees. And uh, one out of every three to four bites of food you take is thanks to the bees. Now, honey, honey bees are responsible for about 15 billion in U.S. agricultural crops each year. And, and just like uh, Becky was saying, the bee, the bee is uniquely uh, genetically formed for this process. Um, if you, uh, bees are basically, it's hard, to t it's hard to see, are covered in fine hair. And by their beating wings, they can create an electrostatic um, charge on them. Wow. So as the bees go from, from flower to flower to plant to plant, trying to get nectar, and that's the, one of the amazing things of Mother Nature, is that bees were genetically not making um, to go to the pollen. They're going to get the nectar. And the byproduct of their food source, which is nectar, which is what they make honey out of, the pollen gets stuck to their bodies. They also have on their back legs buckets where they take the, the pollen because they also eat pollen and they brush it down to their legs. And so when they're going to a flower and get their nectar, they're getting charged and they're also getting pollen. So when they move from plant to plant, they're just moving that pollen on their bodies to the other plants. And as they're digging down to get to the bottom of that flower, they're pollinating that flower. Weird. How fortunate. Yes, what, for everybody. What a, what a wonderful byproduct. Yeah. <laughs> Very cool. And thank you, Doug. Uh, Christina. How about butterflies? Do butterflies partake in pollination? If so, can you tell us how? So it's very similar to what Doug talked about with bees, only for butterflies. A lot of people don't realize, and truly I didn't actually until I started raising butterflies, they're fuzzy. And by fuzzy, I mean they're actually, they have modified scales. So similar to the scales on their wings, but they appear like hairs and they're on their back. And it's very similar to bees. It's just a byproduct. They're after the nectar in these plants and they collect pollen as they go about doing that. But what's unique about butterflies is because they're larger than bees, they're actually able to pollinate a different type of plant than what bees can. There's some types of milkweed that can only be pollinated by butterflies because it has to be carried by something that's a substantial size. So it's pollen sacs can actually stick little bees' feet. I can't tell you how often I've come across, we have um, swamp milkweed, and perennis milkweed and I've come across ours and we have little bees that are stuck in them and I just you know take their little feet out and say go go you know because they get they try to get in there and get that that nectar but those pollen sacs will get them because they're they're pretty sticky and they stick to them but because of that butterflies are able to carry those from plant to plant so they do serve a very similar purpose obviously they don't make honey which would be really cool but you know <laughs> They don't, but they do serve a very similar purpose to bees. And most people don't realize that because if you look at a butterfly, you don't inherently think, oh, look at this fuzzy creature that's capable of carrying pollen until you take a real close look at them and you realize they do actually have those modified hairs that are specifically designed for that. Isn't that amazing? Wow. It is. <laughs> and Marianne, thank you, Christina. Marianne, what about birds? How do birds fit into pollination? So, you know, across the Western Hemisphere and around the world, there are all kinds of birds that are pollinators, but, you know, looking more close to home, it's the hummingbirds, in particular in our area, the ruby-throated hummingbirds. And just like the bees, just like the butterflies, they are after that sweet nectar. It's um, critical for their survival because of their incredibly high metabolic rate. 
you know, for a humming, a ruby throated hummingbird, they have to feed every three and a half minutes just to stay alive. They need, they need the insects and the spiders for protein, but it's all about that, the nectar. And as they're licking up the nectar, of course, they're getting dusted with um, pollen and then transferring that pollen to other other flowers and helping with pollination. And there are over 300 species of hummingbirds across the Western Hemisphere. And many of them, because of the specific shape of their beak and length of their beak, they can solely pollinate certain types of plants. So there are many plants that will solely rely on particular species of hummingbirds for pollination. Um, so for, the, for those flowers to generate and um, propagate, they need the hummingbirds. Okay, wonderful. Do these creatures look for anything specific? Are they, 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 do they tune into a certain color or, or a shape of a plant? How, how does that work? Well, definitely for hummingbirds, for many hummingbirds, they are looking for shapes, tubular shapes and bright colors, particularly reds and oranges. Um, most birds don't have a tremendous sense of smell, so they're not Typically, the, the plants that the hummingbirds are going to aren't very fragrant because that's not, you know, what they need or what they're one of the cues that they're looking for. Um, but definitely shape and color for birds. But Christina and Doug can talk about that with bees and butterflies. So how do, how do I get, I can share some, some cool flower pictures. How do I share a screen? I don't know. <laughs> Who was going to give me? Oh, Jen, Jenny will. Jenny's muted, but I think she's telling you us she's. You should try it now. See okay. what happens. Let me see. Darren, I just wanted to point out that Leo has joined us. So, yeah, does I anyone see. see this picture? Yes. yes. So, when we talk about bees and uh, their eyesight, they have 13,000. Fragments of their eyes, and they uh, they actually have five eyes on, on a bee. But as you can see here, humans are the normal uh, scale that we all know about. But bees see in in um, ultraviolet, and so what's interesting when we talk about flowers and the type of flowers, uh, they've done research and and uh, taken ultraviolet pictures. Uh, in the scope of that bees can see in, and they have found some amazing things. So on your left is a standard dandelion. But when you take it under ultraviolet light that a bee can see, wow. the one on the right, it turns out to be a target. So they know exactly where the nectar is. Here's another one. Plain looking yellow flower but because of the pigmentation around the center, the bee sees a target where the pollen and nectar is. There's another ultraviolet. So um, you can see that what the bees are seeing is, is completely different than what we see uh, to our eye. And so it, it's very interesting. Uh, bees will go to the best source that they can follow find and they can fly up to six miles away from their hive and basically once they find a good source they go back and I don't know if you guys have ever heard they do what's called a waggle dance and it's actually <laughs> communicating to the hive by the asthmus of the sun um, and the direction the other bees can watch the dance interpret and go to that field uh, for that that flower source. So it's pretty amazing stuff. Yeah, that is, I want to get a pair of ultraviolet glasses because I'm pretty thirsty. Yes, um, yes. <laughs> um, who can tell us um, how best to build like a garden or a house to attract these wonderful creatures to help our local area pollinate? Well, I can I tell you something for butterflies. Oh, oh no, go ahead. Well, just, okay, wait, wait, actually you know, first, I mean, before this, I'm sorry, I'd like to introduce uh, Leo Brito. Hi. Hello. Who's, hi, Leo. How are you? Welcome. He's the owner of the Woodlands Escapes and Zero Waste. So welcome, Leo. We'll, Thank you. Hello. 
we'll say hello in a, in a moment. But yeah, Christina, if you could just take that for starters. Well, so what Doug was talking about with bees, again, going to overlap a little bit with butterflies. They are attracted to certain colors, different from hummingbirds in that they aren't looking for those larger, deeper-throated flowers. They actually need slightly shorter ones because their proboscis is only so long. Um, there are types of moths that have incredibly long proboscis that are, I mean, all of them function like a straw, but we have some that are, it's, it's even longer than their little bodies are. Um, but for a, a butterfly, that's not really how it works. So um, they are attracted to colors, red, orange, yellow, those classic ones. And it does seem like more fragrant flowers attract them. But however, they, they really, they don't smell in, in like the, the sense that we think of how smell works. But they do also use their brush feet when they land on plants. And that's actually how they determine if it's a host plant. And sometimes it's how they can determine just kind of what type of plant they are. When you hear people talk about how butterflies taste with their feet, that's what they're referring to. So they typically, like a monarch, they stand on four legs, but they have those little brush feet and they'll extend them. And my kids call them like T-Rex arms and they'll kind of scratch the surface of the plant that they're on. And that actually lets them know what it, it is in general, if they're looking for a host plant or if they're looking for a nectar plant. So if you're wanting to bring something like that to your yard, things that are fragrant, things that are in constant bloom, that's actually gonna make your yard a source for them to just be there constantly. Things like I have African blue basil that tends to bring a lot of bees and the bees tend to not let anything else nectar, but other stuff does like to nectar on it too. And anything that's a colorful bloom. Very cool. And Marianne, can you add to that please? Um, sure, and so um, diversity of plants is really important and native plants. Um, we are very fortunate in the Houston area to have access to some wonderful garden centers and resources to help build your home um, landscape that's bird friendly, which actually ends up being bee and butterfly friendly also. Um, the birds need the insects for food, the, and then certain birds, of course, need the, the plants for, for nectar, and thus the plants get pollinated. So having a diverse um, landscape with all kinds of native plants, um, Houston Audubon has a dedicated website called Bird Friendly Houston that um, has plant lists and things like that. Many of um, other organizations um, have plant lists. I'm sure if you go to the museum, natural science, they have lists, you know, what, how to attract butterflies, specific species, like Christina says, need host plants plus nectaring plants. Um, so there's a lot of resources on the internet and and when you're looking for plants you really want to find plants that belong in this region the native plants that these creatures the butterflies the birds all the bees everything has have evolved with so they can make use of the chemicals in those plants is really important and the native plants would do much better so if you want the butterflies the bees the birds you really have to um, build a yard of diverse native plants to support all those different wildlife populations. All right, cool. Hey, and Leo. I think, oh. and I think if yeah. I can add to that, Please. I, I think the, all of all the major websites, I know the, all the Texas Bee Association, the Montgomery County Bee Association, on our websites, we all have bee-friendly garden charts because and because we're in texas they're divided out but they they do have charts of bee friendly flowers uh listed so that's another resource for people okay cool. and leo welcome we haven't talked to you yet but um maybe give us a few specific ideas of how to attract these wonderful creatures to our yards cool yeah so actually there's a, a website or there's a um uh, a place i don't know it right off the top of my head but uh it's, it's, a, it's a, you know, it's a certified wildlife habitat uh, organization. And uh, we actually became that at our place. Um, there's many ways to, to become it. And because there's so much wildlife uh, out in Texas, and we're very lucky about that. Uh, I think uh, uh, Texas is probably uh, the state with the most uh, variety of birds, if I'm not mistaken. Um, but I'm not sure. Actually, I, I, I would I actually I'm so factual. I, I would rather read things <laughs> than just saying right off the top of my head. But I'm actually in my garden right now. And I wanted to show everyone uh, the colossal work 
that bees uh, do for for us and for everyone. Uh, mm. I think that we uh, go to bed and we wake up every day not realizing uh, <laughs> that these uh, humble animals uh, wake up just to do that. And there's nothing else that they do uh, other than uh, simply, you know, go, go, back, go back home and go to bed and wake up and pollinate again. <laughs> So, uh, you know, I, I, I tried to, I'm, I'm showing you my cucumbers right now, um, that when we talk about p p pollination, a lot of people don't know uh, that there are, you know, male and female flowers. There's also male and female plants. Uh, this is a, a male cucumber or a female cucumber and uh, a male flower. So what a bee does is the bee comes and uh, it tries to look for the nectar on both plants, but in, in reality, it's just cross-pollinating the, the, the both. And, and, and the, the female fruit re requires uh, of that pollination in order for it to, to happen. So, uh, you know, we can't substitute that work for the bees. Uh, yeah, you can probably by hand uh, select one flower or the other, but if we were to run out of bees, or pollinators, uh, we would be screwed. Uh, we wouldn't have we wouldn't have any more food. We wouldn't have anything uh, else uh, tr truthfully coming to life. Uh, so so. Uh, anyways, we I, I want to also instill on how the native landscapes is uh, is such an important and crucial role to to the uh, uh, the livelihood of these animals that are constantly traveling through our area and find shelter in those plants and uh and not they reproduce in those areas and uh they they uh are require a clean environment uh not you know it's not simply about being able to find nectar but how how uh, the quality of of the plant uh you know how clean of a soil the plant's in uh you know i think that uh you know if we were to ask <laughs> And, 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 you know, this would probably go back. It's a, it's a funny joke, you know. If we were to ask a, a butterfly what a milkweed would taste like 100 years ago, they would tell you that the quality of the milkweed went down, <laughs> oh. you know, for, for the soil quality that we have nowadays. So, so I think uh, that, that's also something that we need to take into effect, you know, just like we need more synthetic fertilizers to grow plants now. Uh, you know, uh, uh, I... I I've also read that, you know, the, the, that plants need healthy soil to thrive on that nectar, you know, to, to feed, to feed the, the bees. And, yeah. how, how does, um, I know you're a composting expert. What is composting exactly and how does it um, fit in with uh, a clean environment? So, well, composting, like, a healthy, like a healthy you know, habitat. Breaking down organic matter. I'm not too much of a bee or butterfly expert, so I just only know about them from uh, from from what I read here and there. I, I really focus on food waste uh, uh, and, and composting. And um, uh, composting is the the, the, uh, the decomposition of organic matter. There's several ways of doing that through worms and aerobic and anaerobic. You know, aerobic means with the presence of oxygen, and anaerobic means without the presence of oxygen. Um, and and uh, what I do is circulate a uh, design that uh, uh, selectively uh, uh, picks up those resources, the green waste, the food waste, and the compostables, and, and we recycle them close to the environment. And then we, uh, you know, we put it back in, in where exactly where it came from. So, um, it, it, you know, it composting is one thing uh and and what composting brings to the table is a whole nother thing uh composting is going to allow everyone to uh obliterate the recycling uh mentality and the waste uh uh, uh problem that we have as a society and it will allow us to bring all of the resources back that we take from the earth and put them back where it belongs uh, so, I, you know, if I didn't have clean compost and clean soil, I wouldn't have clean plants and the bees wouldn't be thriving. Very you important. Yep. So, healthier the soil, the more, more plants we have, the healthier the, the, you know, the environment for those animals to live in. 
you know uh and and so you know that's that's it, it's it's a it's a closed loop system you know it, it, everything's connected and we have to realize that we you know we'll have cleaner air cleaner water uh you know taking care of our environment really uh doesn't just benefit uh, one species it benefits everyone yeah uh, yeah absolutely well, it's good work that you do. Doug, uh, what are we doing to save the bees? Well, uh, you know, I was going to tell Leo that uh, my bees are right on the border of, of the woodlands and magnolia. And uh, so my bees are probably are traveling to your cucumber plants. I have about a half a million bees on my apiary area. Uh, they're on branch crossings. So uh, hopefully they're coming out to help you out. So... Um, but uh, Darren, to answer your, your question, it, it's pollination is, it, it's an, it is a big, big business in the United States. And because uh, lots of states, Texas is lucky that we have lots and lots of commercial beekeepers and hobbyist beekeepers. And uh, as we build our populations back from the, you know, in the 90s, everyone heard about the, uh, hive um, uh, collapse disorder, and um, call, they call it CCD, colony collapse disorder. Everyone has heard of that. And uh, it was basically um, kind of a combination of chemicals people were using in their fields, in their gardens, in the soil, in industry, <laughs> along with um, some new pests that came. Uh, there's, a, there's a mite and uh, that mite attaches itself to bees and basically sucks their, their fluid. And uh, that helped to start, stop the population. And we lost lots of bees. California lost about 90% of their bees. And mm -hmm. one of the reasons why we have so many um, pollinating uh, businesses and these, these um, big commercial beekeepers who have thousands and thousands of hives, they'll put them on a semi truck and put screens over them and take them to California. Uh, California has a huge um, agricultural um, population and they'll move thousands of hives, for instance, for the almonds in California. The almond groves need 1.6 million hives to pollinate all the almond groves. Well, California only has about 600,000 hives. And so from all over the nation, beekeepers and commercial beekeepers have to bring their hives to California. It's a, it's a big business and they bring, they bring their hives. The, the bees go out and pollinate all these different crops. And then as they come back home, they'll go across the United States as the different growing seasons start. And so they'll go from California to the Dakotas down to the top of Texas, back down to hives uh, around our areas. And so that helps to build the hive population back up. And beekeeping has become a really um, fun hobby. And up in these clubs, the uh, state of Texas has about 35 different clubs throughout the state that promote beekeeping as a hobby, as a business. And so that, that's what we need to keep doing is having good, good pest-free gardens and uh, lots of people that like to, like to have a new hobby and, and um, raise bees. So that that, right. all those connected helps to, to grow the population back. Awesome, well, thank you for that. Now for our star, Christina Smith. Um, <laughs> Would you let us know how um, your local environment has influenced your art and your relationship to it, please? Oh, well, I live in the Ozark Mountains. I live outside of Fayetteville, actually, in the woods. And uh, I didn't grow up this way. This is what I, I found when I left home. And, and I really enjoy being out in nature. And I think that it, it helps all of us. It really... Nature gives a, a calmness to your spirit that, that really helps you know what's important in life. Uh, it, and that's, I go for walks through my woods and I find odds and ends 
bits of sticks and lichen, um, a mushroom, different things that will set me off and, and start a painting for me. Great. And have you noticed that your art influences the external world in any way, in any environments? Well, it influences people. It influences people, too. Yeah. The, uh, my favorite comment that I get from past customers is that the peace that they have in their home gives them peace, that they look at it every day and, and they get peace from it. And I think that I love that. I think that's really important to all of us. Um, there's all kinds of art, but I, I like the I, of living with something that cheers you up. <laughs> I like your picture of that bee over your left shoulder. Well, thank you, sir. That's pretty. Thank you. There's almonds in that picture, too. I was surprised when I researched for that. I knew bees were very important, but I was surprised at how many crops they do pollinate, like yeah. almonds and turnips. I don't think of that. I think of apples and oranges. Mm -hmm. uh, Christina, have you um, lived in different places? And in, in different places, has that influenced your art? And if so, how? Um, I've lived in different places and always wanted to come home. So <laughs> no, I would say no, this was home to me. Yeah. It's the kind of environment I really like. I do shows east of the Rockies, a lot of places. I like hill country. Um, I lived in Phoenix for a while and, and going over a dry ditch that they said was going to be a river. That didn't thrill me. Uh, I, I like hill country. I like curvy roads and not knowing what's across the what's around the corner. And I'm just curious about your actual artwork. Like, how do you find inspiration to to work on a, an insect versus a flower versus you know or a bird? What what do you look for? Is it a certain season or a certain time of day or? or oh no, there's my work actually is very slow, so. Uh, time of day doesn't much matter. It's going to take me a long time to do whatever I set out to do. But I had been wanting to do a bee for a long time. And I had different ideas about how to set it up. Uh, this is simply what happened as I worked. I, I decided to put a different agricultural product in each honey cell. That that would tell a story. I call it working behind the scenes with two E's for the behind. Yeah. And, and <laughs> behind painting, the scenes. Behind the scenes. Uh. Paintings all start in different ways. Sometimes it's a bird I want to do, and other times it's a pine cone I found, and then things get built around it. They, they all start in different ways, but I have a long list in my mind of birds, mostly birds, that, that I just haven't got to yet. I'm working on a peregrine falcon right now. That's oh, one of my I want to do. Pretty yeah, cool. they're really something. That that's a bird. That's the fastest creature on Earth. Somewhere between 200 and 240 miles an hour. No way, really. Yeah, yeah. They, there's different opinions. National Geographic clocked it. I forget 240 or 260. Wow. But I will tell you a little less. The thing is, is it goes up high then turns itself into a bullet that just dives. Oh, oh I see. And I, I found, we're getting off on peregrines instead of pollinators, but oh. when I, I research as much as I can about what I'm doing. And you know, you look at a jet engine, the engine part, and it has a circle nozzle sort of thing with another piece in the middle. That's copied from a peregrine falcon's nostril. It, it slows down the airflow so that bird can still breathe as it goes down at more than 200 miles an hour. And jet engines are structured the same way for the same reason, to slow down that airflow. Anyway, nature is just fascinating and there's, there's always more and more and more to learn. I'm sure. Yeah. Becky, if you're in the world work. Um, Becky, uh, what can we do now to help birds and bees in our gardens and in the world? I think what we can do now, you know, there's there's big and small things and there's things that each of us can do that, you know, sometimes 
problems seem overwhelming or ideas seem overwhelming, um, you know, but it can be simple as just um, creating, you know, a butterfly garden that like Christina was saying is distracting her out the window, um, you know, or creating a garden, um, trying to get more bees, or trying to get um, different birds to come through. So you can do that at your own house. You can start, you know, with one container <laughs> of a, you know, of a milkweed, say, for monarchs. Um, that's actually been really fun for my family. And then, um, you know, there's also other ideas you can do, and that is, you know, helping to protect natural areas around you, helping to protect those native habitats that already exist. They don't need to be planted, they're already there. Um, and so that that surrounds us all. But you know, really, it can be anything, you know, any small step is a good move. Um, you know, one thing, I think it was Doug, you were talking about, um, you know, I, I don't think you meant to be, but you were talking a little bit about pollinator decrease, because um, you were talking about mites and disease. And you know, one thing that's really helpful for pollinators that, uh, uh, you know, a lot of us can do are if you have pets, keep them inside. If you have cats, keep them inside. That's going to help, um, in particular, uh, bird populations. Um, but also, I mean, I don't know. I have cats. I'm a, I'm a big cat lady. Um, if I let them out, they will get everything. <laughs> and so I see that as just, you know, a really, you know, a small step that can have a big impact on our environment. Um, it doesn't have to be you don't have to have um, a lot of acreage to do something positive. Okay, great. And sort of for everybody, what's like the main question you get asked from the public? Why don't we start with Mary Ann? Um, well, I think in terms of pollinators for us at Houston Audubon, it, it's questions about hummingbirds. So we are, um, in a very unique position on the map here on the upper Texas coast and millions and millions of birds um, go back and forth through our area on their spring and fall migration. And I tell audiences all the time, think of the Houston Galveston, this whole region on the upper Texas coast as a Bucky's for the birds. You know, we are their last Bucky's um, before they leave and go across the Gulf of Mexico where their last chance, you know, especially in terms of hummingbirds, to fatten up, to get the nectar, in turn they're pollinating, um, where their last chance to, to get enough fat stored so they can make it across the Gulf to their winter home. Uh, and then again, when they return, where that, that first Bucky's they encounter, um, where they need to find where they need to be able to refuel, find the food, the shelter, fresh water, et cetera. And so people are often asking us, how can I, um, you know, attract hummingbirds? And for, for this area, September, early October is really the big time period for hummingbirds because they know that once they leave our region, they've got to make it across the Gulf of Mexico. So having the native plants, you know, especially the ones that will attract the hummingbirds, the tubular flowers, the reds, the oranges, um, and putting out good quality um, sugar water, which is really easy to make, um, if you, and keeping it fresh, four parts water, one part sugar, in supplemental feeders. They're not going to completely rely on those feeders, but when we have storms, hurricanes, freak weather that damages our gardens, especially flowering plants, we need to do something quickly to replant those natives and to possibly supplement. Um, and it ends up, you know, I think Doug and Christina and, and Becky were all saying it, by helping one, you're helping many species. Um, it, it's not just helping the hummingbirds, it's helping a whole host of wildlife. And like Becky said, we encourage everybody, just get out, visit your local um, park, your county park, city park. We are we are very fortunate across the Houston area to have great green space that nonprofits take care of, that the county takes care of, the city takes care of. Um, walk along the Woodlands Waterway. You know, let your kids um, discover the birds and the bees and the butterflies. Let them have that great 
um, moment when they get excited about seeing all these different critters. Don't pull them away. Oh my gosh, it's a bee, you know, let them experience, experience it. The bees don't want to have anything to do with us. They want that nectar and the pollen. So um, we're very fortunate in this area. So I tell people, get your, you know, like, he, like, like I said, even if it's a very small container garden, I had a lady the other day tell me that she had tons of hummingbirds at her place. And I said, oh, where do you live? She lived on the third story of an in an apartment, third story, and she just had her outside patio, you know, balcony that she filled up with plants and, and put some feeders out. She had more um, hummingbirds than we did here at our education center. Um, so if you, if you build it, they will come, so to speak. Okay, very nice. Becky, what's the most common question you're asked? I think the most common question we get, so we have preserves uh, that are open to the public where folks can walk around um, and see native plants um, and animals. And the, mo the questions that we get are, you know, first it's, what is that? <laughs> <laughs> um, and then people want to know, you know, do birds like it? Do butterflies like it? I'll be honest. I'm sorry, Doug. A lot of people are still afraid of bees, but more and more they're coming around. Um, but so, yeah, I think, um, you know, one thing that people can do is, you know, get outside in these natural spaces and learn what's around you. And, um, you know, that's usually what they're asking us is, what is this? And, um, can I plant this at home? And now there's a lot of uh, nurseries um, that have native plants that you can plant at home. And that's gonna be really beneficial. And, and you know, not just beneficial, it's gonna be fun. It's gonna be fun. <laughs> that's yeah. wonderful. All right, and Doug, what about you? What's the most common question you're asked? You know, it's, it's uh, I'll, I'll probably have to say, um, how do we help save the bees? Because it's very interesting because of all the colony collapse news, Jerry Seinfeld's movie, The Bees. And um, bees really have been in the forefront of the press and the news. And so we help rescue bees in swarms throughout the county. And, uh, and it's very interesting because everybody knows that it's, it's good to help save the bees. And so some of the tips that we, we tell people is um, chemicals, any kind of chemicals in your garden from, from Roundup to pesticides to herbicides to all sorts of different chemicals help. It, it might not be immediate like in herbicides for a bee, but um, it does affect them. They, they think that the herbicides are affecting their GPS. So when these million hives go from Texas to California and the Californians are spraying some sort of a herbicide on their almonds, um, it actually can cause the bees to pollinate but not find their way back to their hives because of the, of the chemicals. So it's really uh, this, the, kind of the age old uh, to be careful what you put out in your gardens, on your plants, on your lawns, on, on your weeds because there are natural ways to control. You can kill weeds with salt and vinegar water and, and uh, that won't hurt your, the, the insects and bees. But I think that's probably the most uh, question that I'm asked. Okay, wonderful. Christina, what about you? Butterfly lady. So I teach a lot of butterfly classes and a lot of times I think I, I tend to overwhelm people because I talk about these different species that I've raised and then you have these people that are like, oh my gosh, how do I just see more butterflies in my yard? I don't have a room to dedicate to raising them, you know? And I always tell people just a lot of the same things like Becky said, like Mary Ann said, start small because that's exactly how we got into the, the raising that I do started very small. My kiddo's school has an incredible gardening program. I knew very, very little about the plant side of all of this while I had actually started to learn a lot more about the butterfly side. And that kind of rounded out my knowledge, helping their learning these plants are what are going to bring these into my yard. Some people want to see the life cycle. That's when you get into the difference between host plants and nectar plants. 
And some people just want to see more beautiful butterflies flying around. My neighbor tells me on a regular basis, thank you for your yard because I see butterflies constantly. And she said for years before we lived here, she really never did. And now they're constant, you know, out here. And I think I amuse all of my neighbors because some mornings I walk outside still like pajama clad and I'm like, okay guys, and I'm releasing butterflies because I raise a few thousand every year, which I don't even a little bit expect people to do. I do it to learn more about them. I do it because I teach in a lot of different programs and what better way to teach than to know the life cycles that you're teaching about inside, outside, backwards, forwards. And I don't expect people to pick up the hobby in the same way that I do, but just echoing what a lot of people here have said already is just have plants in your yard, have the plants that they need, um, reducing your chemicals for sure. Um, that was something that I actually didn't know anything about either. And now that I have, it's completely changed kind of how we manage our weeds, how we manage our yard in general. And just that, you know, it's, oh, if I want to see a butterfly that looks like this. And, you know, I actually told a friend, she said, I see these black and yellow butterflies. Why do I see them? And I said, because you have orange trees in your backyard and they're laying eggs on them. And she had no idea that she already had a bit of an environment going on because a lot of people just don't know. Okay, cool. All right. Well, thank you <laughs> for that. I appreciate it. Does anybody from the audience have any questions? Anybody, anybody, anybody. They can just add them to the chat if they do. Okay. All right. I have well, a question now, yeah, if first, I may. Please. Doug, uh, I am one of those people that are very afraid of flying insects. Um, do bees sting or what type of bees do sting? Yes, yes. So it's, it's another fun fact when I teach elementary school, and it's always fun to watch the crowd of little kids because the boys and the girls, because I, when I announced that only girl bees have stingers, they always turned to the boys and bow up and said, see, see. <laughs> and, and so, uh, yes, um, they have stingers, only, but the mass population in a hive are worker bees, which are female, and they do have stingers. And again, it's a, it's a very intricate process of the stinger because once they sting, it basically pulls the stinger and some of their internal organs out and does two things. It kills the bees. So bees, unlike wasps and hornets, only sting once and then they die. But in stinging something, it could be an enemy, it could be, could be me, it, um, when the stinger pulls out, it creates a pheromone that marks that spot. So other bees will go after it. And so it's kind of a, marks it. So if it was a, a dog or a bear trying to tear up their hives, the other bees can go. And, you know, I was reading some t statistics and uh, the statistic of, of getting stung and you being a deathly allergic because there are people that are deathly allergic of different uh, insect stings that have to walk with EpiPens, um, it doesn't affect most people too badly. They usually have some, some stinging and uh, sensation and redness and some swelling. And it usually goes away in three days and a lot of people will take Benadryl or an ice cube on it. But um, it's, it's, bees are scary to a lot of people and, and I, I forgot who said it, but they were right about bees just want to go, I think it was Marianne. They just want to go from flower to flower and take care of business. And they only sting when they're threatened, swatted at, or when beekeepers try to take their honey off their hive, um, they, they get upset. So they're not, they're, not, they're not too scary. Can I add to that real quick? Please. I actually, when I was little, I used to get I, I was the kid who I think I always get stung by bees all the time, like all the time. And, uh, you know, I got to a point where I grew up and I had bees with uh, that fear of bugs. And the praying mantis was the bug that introduced me uh, to letting go of that fear. I actually adopted a praying mantis friend and uh, through the praying mantis, I was able to uh, 
understand uh, that uh, they're actually uh, very intelligent beings and uh, they, they, they don't care for human beings. Uh, they actually are, are, you know, bees, like you said, they're worried about uh, what they're doing. And actually I walk through my garden all the time and I have flowers that line up and down all the way through my body. And I have to cut across some of the areas that they're pollinating. And they don't even realize that I'm just pushing through and move. I mean, they just kind of, you know, move along. They're really friendly beings. I, 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 uh, I think that this, the, this, this belief that they will uh, sting you, I, 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 you know, I think you just have to not be so conscious of your surroundings, you know. So maybe just being a little more conscious of, of you know, wh where you're at and wh what, maybe what you're stepping on and what you're walking around would, would, get, would not get you stung. <laughs> so. Did he teach you Kung Fu? <laughs> That chamomile, actually, and, and chamomile grows pretty wild, you know, like up and down. So when you walk through, yeah, you know, they're they're everywhere up there, and so they're they're not minding anybody's business, you know. Nice. And Leo, what's what's the most common question you are usually asked? I'm sorry. What is the most common question that you are asked about? In about it. Compost, I guess. Uh, well, I think uh, uh, I get asked a lot of questions. I think, um, well, maybe more than anything, my, my biggest advice for people who are trying to learn more about the environment and sustainability and doing something better for the environment is uh, be, uh, be open to change and be open to learn and and know that this is a this is about failing not about succeeding <laughs> you're going to fail a lot more until you learn how to grow something or or you know i think milkweed is actually uh, a very tough you know serious uh, plant to grow you know people people have challenges with aphids and then they buy ladybugs and 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 uh, you know it's just this you know so so be, uh, learn about creating a, a healthy environment simply by, uh, by, by utilizing what you've got, you know, start Googling. If you didn't know what that plan is, search it, you know, start learning the names of it. Um, you're, you're going to find that you have a lot more surprising plants in your house because right around your house than you thought you knew. So I, I, again, I think it's being, being conscious of our surroundings and taking time to actually look and see. Uh, so that's probably my, my, my biggest advice, you know, but I get asked a lot of questions. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure, I'm sure you all do. So I want to wrap up by, you know, thanking all the panelists and especially our artist, Christina Smith, for your beautiful talent and works of art. Keep, keep at it. And uh, remember, everyone, to um, shop the festival and visit the artist's booths because art matters. <laughs> All right. Thank you all. Thank you all. Thank you all for joining. <laughs> Learned a lot. Thank you very Bye. much. Thank you. Have a great Bye -bye. Thank you. Bye, guys. Bye. Bye.